Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for tuning in for another exciting video this week. So today we are diving into the world of package management, Conda, Anaconda, Miniconda, Bioconda and virtual environments with a focus on our environment. So in this video, we are going to demystify these essential tools for bioinformaticians and data science professionals. And I know a lot of you have previously reached out to me regarding your struggles with installing packages, maintaining dependencies or maintaining consistent developmental environments or ensuring your pipelines are reproducible. So whether you are an expert bioinformatician or just getting started, the knowledge of these tools can be a game changer in your um, analysis journey and especially when you are working or building some pipelines. We often work with various projects, each with its own set of requirements, tools and dependencies. And it's like having different plant species that need specific conditions to thrive. So I like to draw the analogy of virtual environments with terrariums. For those who are not familiar with terrariums, uh, these are essentially self-sustaining ecosystems. At its most basic forms, the terrarium is defined as a sealed transparent globe or similar vessel in which plants are grown. So similarly, in the coding world, a virtual environment is like a controlled, um, isolated space for a specific project. It's uh, like if we could um, create separate little terrariums for each project with their own um, requirements, own conditions to nurture the software we are working on. So changes in one terrarium won't impact the others. Similarly, for virtual environments, um, changes in one environment does not affect another. So for example, let's say if you're working on a project and you need a different version of Python, let's say you need Python 3.6 with specific li libraries, uh, while another project requires Python 3.8 and with their different set of dependencies and requirements. So with virtual environments, you can create these isolated spaces to keep your projects healthy. You can have different versions of these tools and softwares in each of the isolated environments and prevent them from interfering with each other. Let's consider two real world scenarios in context of bioinformatics analysis. So in the first scenario, imagine you want to try three different analysis workflow, one for GWAS study, and you want to try two different variant calling um, analysis uh, workflows. Unfortunately, these workflows require similar software, but different versions. In the second scenario, um, you perform an analysis which requires to install certain R packages to run a workflow. It runs fine on your computer and you share it with a member in your lab to reproduce the analysis. And unfortunately, it fails on the other person's system as the pipeline requires a specific version of R and the R packages. Now, the um, alternative solutions to these are for scenario one, you could either run each of the workflow on different machines. And for scenario two, you could ask the other person to install, reinstall and change the package versions to match the package, wo package versions that are present on your um, system. Of course, both of these uh, options are not feasible and are not the optimal solutions. And it would be better to have a system where you could create um, separate isolated environments on one computer where um, ind individually um, the requirements and dependencies and packages could be installed of specific versions in each of these isolated environments. And these environments do not in uh, interfere with each other. So that would be the optimal solution. So there are various uh, software installation and virtual environment managers one can use depending on whether someone's uh, someone's using the Python environment or the R environment. Uh, but another option here is to use Conda. Conda is essentially a package and environment management system. So basically Conda is operating system agnostic, meaning that it works on Windows, Mac and Linux. It enables more simplified software installation along with dependencies, and it allows you to install the binary that is previously compiled versions of the program. It also helps you to search for compatible software versions, and it has access to uh, many software packages, including packages for Python and R. Um, it, the, one of the advantages of using Conda is that it gives you the admin permissions, which is good uh, for use on high performance computers. Uh, otherwise, you would uh, need to request software installations or specific versions by the HPC admin. 
Today, I will be demonstrating how to create virtual environments using Conda. Um, we will be creating two environments in which in each of those we will um, install the same tools, but different versions of the same tool. And you will see how convenient that would be uh, to have the different versions of the same tool without them interfering with each other, which could essentially uh, mean that you could have different versions of the certain tools that you require for your pipelines without them interfering with your uh, with each other or with the tools that are already installed on your system. So I'm sure at some point you might have heard about uh, these terms Anaconda and Miniconda and you must be wondering what are these different um, condas and uh, how different they are from the from each other. So basically Anaconda and Miniconda are distributions or variants of Conda and Anaconda is a full blown um, Python distribution um, including a lot of open source packages and Miniconda comes in two versions. Miniconda 2 is a Python 2.7 distribution and Miniconda 3 is a Python, Python 3 distribution. So Minicondas, as the name suggests, are smaller um, and take up much less drive space compared to the Conda Anaconda because they do not include all the packages that are found in Anaconda. And both of these Python distributions include Conda, which is a package and virtual environment manager. And Conda installs programs from these repositories called channels and Bioconda is a channel that is devoted specifically to bioinformatics programs. A Conda channel uh, refers to a repository or a location from which Conda can fetch the packages. Conda doesn't just have a single repository where all the uploaded packages live. When a package is uploaded to Conda, it must be uploaded to a specific channel, which is just a separate URL where packages published to that channel reside. So there is a default Conda channel where the stock Conda packages live and these packages are maintained by Conda and are generally very stable. So uh, a lot of this will make more sense when I demonstrate and show you what these channels look like and there are certain priorities that you can set to these channels and whenever you want to install a certain packages Conda will first look at a specific channel that you've given a high priority to and we'll talk about this in more detail when I demonstrate this to you. You might have also come across Mamba. Uh, Mamba is nothing but it's exactly what Conda does, but it's a re-implementation and a better version of Conda. It's much more faster, more efficient, and do not carry certain bugs that are present in Conda. So in addition to Conda, I also want to talk about R environments. Um, so R ENV is a package that helps you to create reproducible environments in R. Um, I usually use Conda to install bioinformatics tools that I run on command line like BWA, GATK tools, Picard, BET tools, SAM tools. Um, I also create environments when I am trying to build a pipeline like a variant calling pipeline and I will try to install all the required tools and dependencies in that environment which prevents it from being interfered or interfering it with other tools and packages that are already installed on my system. Um, and I'm talking about R environments because I'm majorly code in R, but there are equivalents in Python as well to create virtual environments in Python. But I will be talking mainly about R environment today and demonstrating how to create virtual environments in R. So reproducible environments in R projects can be created using R ENV package and R ENV package uh, makes R projects more isolated, portable and reproducible. It provides isolation by allowing us to install or update one package in one project without breaking another project and vice versa. That's because RENV gives each project its own uh, private library. It uh, provides portability to our projects, uh, which allows us to easily transport one, uh, our projects from one computer to another, even across different platforms. Uh, RENV makes it easy to install the packages um, that the project depends on. And lastly, it provides reproducibility. So RENV records the exact package versions in a specific file and ensures that those versions, exact versions are the ones that uh, get installed every time that specific file is used to recreate the environment. It is important to emphasize that RENV is not a one-stop solution for all problems surrounding reproducibility. Rather, it is a tool that can help to make projects more reproducible by helping one part of the overall problem that is R packages. There are a number of other pieces that RENV does not uh, currently provide much help with. Um, like RENV tracks but does not uh, help with the version of the R that is used with the package. RENV can't easily help with this because it is run inside of R. Uh, but you might find other tools that uh, allows you to have multiple versions of R and switch between them on one computer. 
So for today's demonstration, I will be creating two content environments with different versions of the same tools to uh, prove the point that we can have um, the different versions of the same tools uh, in different environments without them interact interacting with each other or interfering with each other or interfering with other uh, programs or tools that are installed uh, on the system. I will also be demonstrating how to export these environmental file uh, environments to a YAML file, uh, which can be shared with others uh, so that they can recreate the same environment. And lastly, um, I will also be demonstrating how to create an environment in R using our ENV package. And I will briefly be introducing the concept of projects in R, uh, where we can we will be using our environment to track the package versions. And these are the requirements for today's demonstration. So this is the official documentation provided by Conda, which provides the installation instructions to obtain Conda. Uh, depending on your requirement, you can install either distribution, the mini Conda or the Anaconda. But they recommend the fastest way to obtain Conda is to install mini Conda, which only includes the Conda and its dependencies. But if you prefer to have all the packages that are part of Anaconda, then you can also install Anaconda. As you can see that Miniconda takes up less disk space and Anaconda takes up a lot more disk space compared to Miniconda. So depending on your um, available disk space and your requirement, you can choose either of the distribution to install. Uh, Conda can be installed on Windows, Mac or Linux. So depending on um, your system, you can open up the instructions for installation for either of this system. So since uh, I have a Mac, I'm going to open up the installation instructions for Mac. I've already installed Conda, so I'm not going to install it again as I have some environments which are set up and I do not want to mess up with those. Uh, but I'm just going to walk you through this process. So the first step requires you to install an installer. The installer is nothing but it's just a bash script. So since I am walking you through uh, the process of installing Miniconda, I'm going to click on the Miniconda installer for Mac OS. So basically it links you to another document which allows you to download the bash script depending on your system built up. Once you have the installer downloaded, you can follow the instructions that they have provided here, which are pretty straightforward. And once you follow these instructions, Conda will be installed on your system. Once Conda is installed, you can open up your terminal and you can check for Conda by typing Conda. And when you do that, um, this help um, page should open up. Basically, this command line should display the help. And you can also or you can also test it out by typing conda space hyphen capital B, which gives you the conda version. So this indicates that you've successfully installed conda. Among the first things that you will be required to do is to um, pre-configure some channels on your conda. So these are basically the locations from where you will be installing your uh, packages. You will have to configure and set up some priorities for your channels um, so that Conda could um, uh, resolve conflicts of the packages which of the same version that exist on multiple channels. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, uh, but I will definitely be linking a documentation if you're interested to read more about that in the description. So currently I have um, these channels. So these are the channels that I've set up for my Conda and I've set up Bioconda as my highest priority channel and it's set Conda Forge as the lowest priority. You can change that according to your preference. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of this priorities, uh, but I will be adding the documentation that explains various parameters that can be set to, um, to, uh, to prioritize the package uh, installation from these channels, especially when uh, the same package exists uh, and the same, uh, the same version of the package exists in different channels and how you would want Conda to prioritize the installation. Having said that, the next thing that I want to prioritize is to show you how to search for certain packages and look up the versions and what channels they are available in. So there is a, a command in Conda called Conda search and you type out the package name. So let us try searching for GATK packages. Um, and when you do that, it should give you a list of the packages with the available versions and what channels these packages are available in. This is helpful when you would want to install certain packages. It will give you information on what versions are available in what channel. So here we can see that there are various versions of uh, GATK available in the Bioconda channel. And we would expect this because GATK is a bioinformatics package and Bioconda is a channel that is um, 
specifically um, uh, that specifically holds bioinformatics packages so before going into the details of creating environments i want to show you the environments that i already have set up on my system so we can take a look at the list of environments by running conda env list command and when we do that you will be able to see the environments that are present on my um, system and um, you'll also be uh, able to notice that there is a base environment and next to it is an asterisk and if you notice that base is also present in parentheses at the beginning of the command line prompt and base is nothing but it's a default um, environment which 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 includes python installation and some um, core system libraries and dependencies for conda and it is best practice to avoid installing any additional packages in the base so we do not uh, install any additional packages in the base environment we always create a separate environment to create uh, to uh, install additional packages and if you activate any other environment this base will be replaced by the name of the environment so that's how you will know which environment you are currently present in so right now we are in base and we do not install any packages here so for the demonstration we wish to create um, two environments so before creating conda environments let us first check um, whether we have any of these tools that or packages that we're wishing to install are they present locally and what versions of them uh, are present the only reason that i want to do that is because i want to show you that um, these um, creating conda environments and installing the same version or a different version of the same tool should not interfere with my local installation and i should be able to have uh, multiple versions of the same tool on my system so I, I said that we would be requiring three uh, tools or packages, uh, Perl, um, FastQC and Picard uh, uh, to be installed on my Conda environments. And I just want to make sure whether I do have that uh, locally. So the first thing that I'm going to check is whether I have FastQC installed. And I'm going to use a which command, which basically um, gives me the location of where, uh, if I have this tool installed, where is the tool installed. And this indicates that this is in a folder that's not a uh, mini conda. So basically this is a local installation and I can type in um, hyphen V to get the uh, version of the FastQC installed locally on my system. Uh, let us check for Perl. So Perl is also installed on my system. And when I type in Perl version, it should give me the version of the Perl that is installed. Uh, let us check for Picard. And it seems that I do not have Picard on my system. So now um, let's go ahead and start creating two environments uh, where we will want to install each of these tools and specific versions of these tools. So before creating, uh, before going into um, creating the environments, let us also search for the available versions. So as I demonstrated this previously, let us use conda search command. So these are the FastQC versions in uh, Bioconda that, that are available. Um, let us also check for Perl. And let us check for Picard. So just want to make sure that these tools are available on Bioconda and we also get the information on what versions are present so we can pick and choose which versions we would want to install in our conda environments so now let us go ahead and create conda environment let's name the first environment as env1 um, as a good practice avoid giving uh, conda environments um, ambiguous names because um, down the line you might not remember what uh, what you have installed in a particular environment unless you go into the details of the yaml file um, so it's better to give some intuitive names or programs or the pipeline that you have um, that you're downloading certain programs for so that will be helpful to identify what the programs must have must have been installed in a particular environment so this is just for the demonstration purpose i'm just giving a very generic name so for picard let's pick version 3.1.0 which is the latest version for Perl. Let's pick 5.34.0 and for FastQC, let's pick 0.12.1. So here you will be able to see that these are the packages that will be installed, the dependencies and the packages that will be installed for um, the packages of your interest. So you proceed with yes. 
and it looks like the package uh, the environment has been created so in order to activate the environment you run the command conda activate env1 and to deactivate you type in conda deactivate so let us activate the command uh, i'm sorry the environment So now notice how the base changes to env1 so now you know that you're present in env1 and let us check um, where the fastqc is installed now you'll see that the location of the fastqc has changed because this is uh, installed in the environment and it's stored in a different uh, location than the one that's uh, pre that was installed um, on my local system and you can also check the version and you'll see that this version is different than what was on our local system. Uh, and this was essentially the version that we chose to install. So we should expect to see the same version. So now let us deactivate the environment and get back to the base. And now let's create the second environment. So here I'm just going to change a few values. So just like what we did for environment one, we are going to go ahead and allow all these packages and dependencies to be installed. And it looks like the second environment is also created. Again, we can go ahead and activate the second environment. Notice how the base changes to NV2. And now let us check where fastqc is installed. So again, it's installed in a miniconda folder, but it's installed in a folder that's specific for um, the env2, that is the second environment. And now let us check the version. And this is a different version from um, the version that is installed in environment one. And again, we expect to see this because we installed this version. So now we have three set of tools that are installed um, on both these environments with different versions. And there are also certain tools or packages that are installed on my local system. So basically I have different versions of the same tool installed on my system right now. So now that we have created these environments, um, let us export this environment to a file so that this uh, file could be shared with others and they can recreate the same environment. So we will be exporting this environment into the YAML file. So now that we are in env2, from within the environment, we can export and create a YAML file. So we use the command conda env export and we redirect or save it to an, a file. So I'm just going to name it environment2.yaml. So YAML files are essentially these files or basically these file formats that are used to set up and create configuration files. So let us save um, this environment and um, all the details of the packages, their versions, the channel, everything, all the information about this environment into a file. So now let us take a look at this file now. So when we open this file, you can see the list of all the packages, dependencies, tools, as well as the name of the environment and the channels being present in this file. So this file can be shared with anyone who wants to recreate the same environment. And they will have the same set of tools, dependencies, and the same versions that are present in your uh, environment. So if you have been shared a YAML file for an environment and you want to reproduce an environment, you can run conda env create file and provide the name of the yaml file uh, and when you run this command you'll be able to reproduce the same environment so now let us switch gears to our environment and r as i said previously i use conda when i'm using bioinformatics packages that i run on command line but there are a lot of analysis that i do in r uh, using r studio so um, it will be helpful to have something like our environment uh, where i can create isolated environments for my projects and i can have my analysis pipeline in those isolated environments so that it will be easy for me to share my analysis with someone who would want to recreate my analysis um, using the same version of the packages that i have on uh, my environment so let us open our studio 
so before going into that detail i want to um, quickly explain um, so in our usually um, there is like a global repository so there are like one or two locations where uh, whenever you download uh, or install any packages it would be installed in those locations so let me quickly show you um, so there is a command called lip parts. So basically lip parts would give you the locations where your packages are installed. So every time you load a package, it is loaded from either of these locations. And this is like a global repository or global location from where your packages are installed and loaded. Whenever you uh, write type in the library and the package name, this is these are the locations from where R would go and look up for these packages. Um, just to quickly show you what packages are installed on each of these uh, locations. So as you can see that each of these locations, there are a lot of packages that are installed, which I use for a lot of my analysis. Um, so every time I try and um, every time i type in the library command to load a package r would go and look at these locations and pull pull out the packages and load it into my r environment now the problem with this setup is that every time uh, i require a specific version of a package or i need to update one package all the other packages that are dependent on it will start having issues or it might break and let's say I had an analysis previously set up on which required a certain version of the package. And if I later update it for another project, the original analysis might not function anymore because it does not find the particular version it requires. So there are a lot of um, issues with uh, having packages uh, at a central location and all the other projects or analysis pipelines accessing them and each of them having separate requirements. It is better to have something which our environment provides, which is essentially having these analysis into separate projects and them having a separate library or a location where these packages can be installed and each of them can be maintained and can be can have like a different version without them interfering with each other. So our studio provides this great feature of creating projects. Our projects are great uh, and it ensures reproducibility because it creates isolated working environments. So basically it creates separate folders and it captures your working environment. So all your analysis scripts, your figures, um, the objects that you create, it maintains a history, all of that uh, is captured and stored in isolated environment. And that can be shared with your collaborator or anyone who wants to reproduce your analysis or um, reproduce um, the environment that you have so our environment can be used within our projects and today I will be creating two environment uh, two projects basically and in one of which we will be using our environment so basically I want to show you how our environment adds in another layer of isolation in terms of um, the packages so it provides you with a separate uh, location where the packages can be installed and updated without it having an effect on the global packages so let us create a new R project and let us name this test one. Uh, I'm not going to check the use R environment with this project because I want to create one project with and without R environment. So this is this is the one that is going to be without R environment. So let us create project. And when you do that, you will be sort of redirected. Um, the, there will be a new screen and you will be able to see that here we have test one, which is which indicates that we are in this project. And within the working directory, you will be able to see that um, a .r project file has been created and this location has been set as our working directory. So let us um, write some script. So first, let us check uh, where our packages will be loaded from. So this is essentially the global location. So I'm just going to paste it here so that and just comment this out so that it's easy for us to visualize. So basically, this is these are the locations where the libraries will be loaded from. And these are our global locations for packages. So let us load uh, the package tidyverse because I want to create a ggplot. And I'm going to use uh, Iris dataset. This is uh, like a very famous uh, open source data available within R. So I'm saving it to a data frame called DF. 
and now i'm just going to plot some figures uh, some some figures or some data from this uh, data frame so let us plot sepal length with sepal width and color it by species let us do a dot plot so this is essentially the figure so let's say that you have a script i'm just creating a very basic script so that we can recreate this in um, the second project as well with the R environment. So here um, we loaded the library tidyverse. We used the um, IDIS data set and we created a plot. And here I also want to do session info. The reason is that because I want to see what version of tidyverse um, is being used here and what versions of ggplot and dplyr have been uh, loaded here as dependencies or as part of tidyverse package. So let us save this script as iris script one and let us save this. Now let us create another project and this one is going to be with the R environment. Let us create a new project and let us name this as test two and let's check the box for R environment, use R ENV with this project. And something to notice here in this uh, folder, it created a, a folder called RENV and it has additional uh, files in addition to the .r project file. Um, and if you go back, you will be able to see that uh, where we created, where we chose the location to create project, we created basically separate folders. So this is the folder that corresponds to the project test one, and this is the folder that corresponds to test two. And now it has set this uh, folder as a working directory. So let us create the um, script. So let's do lib parts first. So now I want to know where um, the packages will be loaded from. And this time you will be able to see that this is a different location from our global path. So this is not the location we got for um, when we did lip paths in our test one project. So basically this indicates that any, any of the packages that we install here will be located or will be stored at a different location. And any updates or changes to these packages should not be affected uh, or not affect any of the global packages or other packages uh, that are installed on my system. So now let us repeat what we did uh, in project uh, one, that is test one. So let us um, load the library tidyverse and this should give me an error. The reason this will give me an error is because now it is fetching from a different location and at this location we haven't installed tidyverse. So let us install tidyverse using our env install function and type in tidyverse. So now it is going to give me a list of all the packages and dependencies that will be installed for tidyverse along with the versions. So we are just going to proceed with yes. And it did install 103 packages in uh, 0.29 seconds, which is quite efficient and fast. So now let us load the library now and repeat what we did in the first project. So let's read in the iris data set and let's plot the sequel length with sequel width and fill with species should be color and create a dot plot so now it created a similar figure what we saw before and let us do session info now so now these are the packages uh, that are uh, in that are loaded in addition to tidyverse and these are the versions of them and now let's say that you want to share um, this environment basically with someone so that they can recreate the they can run the script and get the same result and can recreate the analysis 
So just like in Conda, how we created the environment and we exported the environment to a YAML file, which could be shared with anyone who wanted to reproduce your analysis and recreate the environment. Similarly, in R, we have something called as .log file. So the .log file essentially stores information on the R version and metadata about the packages that are loaded in your environment. So this file could be shared with anyone who wants to reproduce your analysis and it would install the same um, uh, packages that are mentioned in the .log file and the same versions of it that are installed on your system so in order to uh, and here you can see that there is only uh, metadata about the r environment package uh, we do not have any information on the tidyverse or any other packages that are currently loaded so in order to um, record that information into and update the dot log file we have to run a command called snapshot and when you run snapshot, it will ask you whether you want to um, add information about all these packages and their versions in the .log file and you proceed with yes. So when you say yes, the .log file is updated and let us take a look at the .log file again. And now you will be able to see there are a lot more uh, metadata added about the other packages in addition to the R environment. And this is essentially uh, all the packages that are currently in your system with the exact version. And this can be shared with anyone who wants to reproduce uh, and recreate this uh, analysis and recreate the environment as well. So that brings me to the end of this video. Um, this was a short introduction on Conda and virtual environments in R. I will be adding links to several resources in the description section below. I will also be uploading uh, and adding the commands that I ran today on my GitHub repository and you will find the link for the same in the description section as well. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more bioinformatics related content. If you have a question or a topic that you would like me to cover, please leave that in the comments section um, share this video with your friends and co-workers and please stay tuned for more bioinformatics related content i appreciate your support and i'll see you in the next video